Welcome to Mount Tam Astronomy, a summertime lecture series normally held in Cushing Memorial Amphitheater on Mount Tamalpais, north of San Francisco. I'm Tucker Hyatt, founding director of Wonderfest, the Bay Area beacon of science. Please join me now for another enlightening astronomy program. Dark matter is mysterious stuff that affects the motions of galaxies inside and out. But we can't see dark matter at all. It doesn't emit, reflect, or absorb light. In short, it's dark. And it's a big deal since it constitutes 85% of the mass of the entire universe. Robert McGeehy, doctoral scholar at the University of California at Berkeley, and soon to be Line Weber postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Michigan, will illuminate dark matter for us by describing the ingenious methods scientists are using to search for it. Hi, my name is Robert McGeehy, and I'm a six year PhD student at University of California, Berkeley, and a dark matter expert, among other things. My broad field in physics is theoretical particle physics, but I like to think quite a lot about dark matter. So tonight I'm hoping to tell you just a little bit about this mysterious stuff uh, and, and try to illuminate it just a little bit. So in preparing this talk, I decided a good way to go about it would be to try to look at popular media, common news sources, and see what an amateur dark matter enthusiast like yourself might have read over the years. So some articles I found were dark matter still elusive gains visibility in the New York Times as far back as 2002. And I found other articles that were trying to entice their readers with dark matter's interesting qualities. So dark matter was apparently darker than we thought, at least according to this Washington Post article. And dark matter was also something out there. And what I found even more intriguing about this particular article was that dark matter was a mystery to Frank Wilczek. And if you haven't heard of Frank Wilczek, he won the Nobel Prize in physics and he's a theoretical physicist. So if dark matter a mysterious substance for Frank Wilczek, then it must be a very interesting mystery indeed. And then I found some articles that seem to take a slightly different tact. So rather than trying to inspire their audiences and fill them with awe at what this stuff might be, I found some articles that like to point out that scientists themselves were quite befuddled. So there was astronomers baffled by distant galaxy devoid of dark matter and scientists looking for invisible dark matter can't find any in our very own SF Chronicle. And then I found some articles that seemed to paint uh, a much more dire picture. So there was the case of the missing dark matter. Okay, that, that, that doesn't sound too good. Sounds like a missing person. And is time running out on dark matter? And then I was finding actually quite a lot of articles and maybe some less reputable news outlets that were missing the mark altogether. Witches, goblins, and the quest to solve the mystery of dark matter. Now, I'm a dark matter expert, or at least I specialize in dark matter, and I thought about it quite a bit. And I have absolutely no idea what witches and goblins have to do with dark matter other than this article was written a few days before Halloween. So I think actually a catchier title and one that would contain the exact same amount of physics would have been Witches, Goblins, Dark Matter, Oh My. But I digress, and with this little bit of an introduction as to what you might have seen in the news before, let me actually start into what, what we know about dark matter. So first, let me start off with uh, one of the very few concrete things that we know about dark matter, and that's 
how much of this stuff there is. So first of all, I need to back up a second and describe ordinary matter. So by ordinary matter, I mean everything that you and I know and love on Earth and uh, in the stars and in galaxies and in our universe that we observe. So this is everything made out of atoms, everything made out of elements, out of protons and electrons and heavier cousins of particles. This is what I mean by ordinary matter. And in my little picture here of what you might recognize as a small fraction of the Golden Gate Bridge peeking up above the clouds, this, this is going to be the ordinary matter. If we zoom out, one of the few facts that we know about dark matter is that it makes up an incredibly large fraction of all of the matter in the universe. So roughly 85% of the material universe is this dark matter stuff, and only 15% of the universe is this uh, ordinary matter stuff, or at least 15% of its material content. So uh, that should be surprising, perhaps, because the only thing that we really know about from daily experience and also from our experience as astro enthusiasts is, is ordinary matter. So the fact that there's so much more of this dark matter stuff should be quite surprising and hopefully intriguing. I can also give a slightly more scientific analogy. So here we have our periodic table of elements, which you may or may not recall from middle school or high school. I know myself personally, I, I don't know quite a lot of these elements by heart. And it's been many years since high school chemistry. So especially these like heavier elements down towards the bottom, I, I really don't know these names uh, by, by rote memory. And so if I just cross off a few of these quite heavy elements, which I'm not super familiar with, and you might not be as well, then actually I've, I've crossed off 15% of the elements. So all the remaining elements fractionally could be corresponding to dark matter, for instance, and these few heavier elements that we normally don't care about terribly much could correspond to the fraction of ordinary matter. So this is just to paint a picture that, that this dark matter stuff really makes up quite a lot of the universe and it might be very interesting. All of these lighter elements are infinitely more interesting and useful to me in my daily life and with dark matter making up so much of the universe, especially relative to ordinary matter, it's potentially a very interesting and, and useful thing. So how do we know how much dark matter there is? How, how have we discovered dark matter? Well, one of the first ways that we discovered dark matter is by a simple gravitational principle that's been known since Isaac Newton wrote down his law of gravity. And that principle is simply that further goes slower. So what I mean in particular is that if I have some massive gravitating body, like the sun in our solar system, and I have planets going around it, then planets that are further away are gonna go slower. So fortunately, I have a nice simulation, a little video to demonstrate precisely this. So as we're zooming into the solar system here, the only thing I want you to note is that the further out planets in our solar system are indeed going slower around the sun and the closer in planets are going faster. So this is what I mean by further goes slower. And it's directly a consequence of the fact that the force of gravity decreases the further away you get from that heavy, massive thing that's tugging on you. So astronomers have known this, again, since Newton. And astronomers have tried to apply this to much larger gravitating bodies like galaxies, for instance. So here's a picture of what our Milky Way kind of looks like. And let me just try to apply this same principle of further go slower to our Milky Way. So I have two stars here. 
one that's closer into the Milky Way, closer into the center, where most of the gravitating mass is, and one that's a bit further out. And if I were to apply our further goes slower principle, I would expect from Newton that the further out star would therefore be going slower. But astronomers started noticing in the 20th century that actually these further out stars and galaxies go similar. So this is quite a conundrum. So one explanation that you might have for this is that Newton and Einstein might have made a mistake. So Newton wrote down his law of gravity and this, this predicted that further would go slower, further out stars would be going slower. And Einstein's theory of general relativity, while building on top of Newton, also made the same sort of prediction for, for stars that are in the outer rims of galaxies, namely that they should also be going slower. And so, so one explanation is perhaps both of these giants of physics made a mistake. But uh, you might be called a blasphemer if, if you were to suggest that both Newton and Einstein were wrong. And certainly it would be very gutsy to do so. And you better have some good evidence to, to back up your claims of, of these two individuals being incorrect. So what we now understand is that they're not actually wrong. What's happening is there's a lot more stuff in galaxies that's allowing for these further stars to go faster. So in particular, here's a little artistic depiction of a galaxy in the center. That's that little spirally arm shape. And then all of this blue stuff that's outside of it, this is meant to represent what we call dark matter. This is matter. It's massive stuff that is tugging on those outermost stars and allowing them to go faster than we would expect. But I should also point out here that this being an artistic rendition and us needing, needing to visualize this dark matter, the artist has colored all of these dark matter blobs as blue, but they're actually dark in that we can't see them. We can't see the dark matter. That's why we thought that further should be going slower because we didn't think there was any more mass the further we went out in our galaxy. So it turns out amazingly that in all galaxies, such as some that you see pictured here, in all galaxies that astronomers can actually measure the speeds of stars, it turns out that they're going too fast. Namely, these outermost stars are actually going way too fast than what you would expect via Newton or Einstein. And that's simply because there's all of this dark matter stuff that has a lot of mass that's tugging on those outermost stars. And we're under predicting how fast those stars should therefore be going because we don't actually see this mass. It's dark. So as a little historical aside for a second. Vera Rubin was a terrific astronomer who was one of the first people to really demonstrate this phenomena of galaxies, stars going faster than they should. And so this is actually coming from one of her first papers in, in 1980. And now we, we don't really need to be able to read this plot uh, terribly well. I just want to point out that the horizontal axis represents the distance of stars from the center of their respective galaxies, and the vertical axis represents their velocities, how fast they're going. And each of these different curves drawn here corresponds to the stars in different galaxies. So the most important observation that we can make here is simply that as you go further out, in all of these different galaxies, aka as you go along the horizontal axis, you're not actually seeing that velocity dip off. You're not seeing further go slower, 
But in fact, what you're seeing via these curves is that further is in fact going similar. And this was really one of the first concrete evidences that we had that there was some non-visible, non-luminous material stuff in galaxies that was tugging on all of these stars. So one natural question you might have now is, is this dark matter stuff, is it really different? So, you know, I told you at the very beginning, a few slides ago, that dark matter makes up 85% of the material universe and ordinary matter only makes up 15%. But a reasonable question is, well, you know, maybe dark matter is just normal stuff. Maybe it's just made out of atoms and, and elements that we know and love from here on Earth and, and in stars that we do see. And maybe for whatever reason, that stuff is just not shining or reflective. Maybe it's not shining too brightly. Maybe it's too dim and our telescopes can't see it. And from what I've told you so far, that's, that's not a terribly unreasonable thing to suspect or to propose that, hey, maybe it's just normal stuff that we can't see. But it turns out it's actually very, very different than normal stuff. So one way that we can see that is by looking at mergers of clusters of galaxies. So I'm going to show you a little simulation here, a little video. And what you're going to see is two clusters of galaxies. That's groups of lots and lots of galaxies that are going to collide head on at a really, really insane speed, something like over 4000 kilometers per second. And as these clusters of galaxies are going to be colliding, we're going to see the ordinary matter do some interesting things and the dark matter do some interesting and very different things. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. So the ordinary matter here is depicted in red and dark matter, on the other hand, is depicted in blue. So as these clusters of galaxies are smashing one into the other, you see that all of the ordinary matter is getting all tangled up and, and smushed, right? And it's interacting and it's really feeling kind of like frictional forces uh, between itself as you might expect. But the dark matter, these two blobs of dark matter that are in both of the clusters of galaxies, they actually seem to pass one right through the other without any kind of hindrance or care in the world about smashing into another blob of stuff at an insane speed. So in this sense, this dark matter stuff is really acting kind of ghostly. It's just passing right through the wall of ordinary matter and the other cluster of galaxies, as well as all of the dark matter in the other clusters of galaxies. So in this sense, dark matter is very, very different than ordinary matter. And, and this kind of evidence is, is telling us that it must be. So you might say, okay, well, that's all fine and dandy, but what you just showed me was a simulation of a video. It's, it's not actually real world data or evidence, but in fact, this simulation is a simulation of a known and observed merger of clusters of galaxies. So now what I'm going to show you is, is actual astronomical observations and data of a particular merger of two clusters of galaxies called the bullet cluster. So at first we're going to see uh, the optical, uh, so in optical wavelengths, and then we're going to see this merger happening. So one wavelength of light that we're viewing here is x-ray and this x-ray is tracing out all the ordinary matter in the two clusters of galaxies and that's in red as per the video and then we see in blue more interestingly this these these dark matter clumps that are also coming with those clusters of galaxies and now this is a real snapshot of a merger that happened quite a long time ago but at this very high rate of speed, this over 4,000 kilometers per second. And the video I showed you previously is a simulation of this exact merger that we've actually observed astronomically. And importantly, 
it has the same features of the video I showed you. Namely, all the ordinary matter that's shown in red via this x-ray gas, it's in passing one through the other, it's gotten muddled up. It's, it's interacted quite substantially, and you can see that it's, it's really fuzzed out and felt, and felt the interactions of the other cluster of galaxies passing through it, whereas the two blobs of dark matter have really just gone through one through the other without noticing anything about the other cluster of galaxies. So now a natural question you might have is, you're showing me dark matter, and you're saying that this is an observation of dark matter, actual astronomical data, but you've told me that we can't see dark matter. So what what's going on here? Is, is this just some sort of silly physicist or astronomer oxymoron? Perhaps it's not too unlike Mark Twain saying the coldest winter he ever had was a summer that he spent in San Francisco, which I'm sure if you're from the Bay Area, you can appreciate. But in fact, it's, it's not an oxymoron. But before I can tell you how we indirectly see dark matter, not directly, not via it giving off photons of light, but indirectly, we need to review a basic principle from Einstein's theory of gravity. And Einstein's theory of gravity is the theory of general relativity, if you've heard of it. And one basic principle that we need from it, the only one that we really need from it for our purposes right now, is that gravity affects everything, even light. So let's just try to apply this principle to see how it might allow us to indirectly observe dark matter. So here I've got a pile of dark matter and hopefully fittingly I've decided to assign dark matter the devil emoji because it's very sneaky and mysterious and it doesn't want to be discovered or found. So all, all of this dark matter is just a bunch of devil emojis and now let's say that we're astronomers and, and we want to go and look for this dark matter stuff. So prior to Einstein, if I'm an astronomer and I look and I see stars, for instance, what I'm seeing is light coming directly from the stars to my telescope and dark matter, by definition, does not interact with light. It doesn't reflect light. It doesn't absorb light. It doesn't emit light. And so before Einstein, the understanding I'd have of this, of this whole setup is that the light from distant stars would just come to my telescope through the dark matter without it messing it up at all. And I wouldn't be able to tell that there was a clump of dark matter in between my, my telescope and myself and the stars I was looking at. So this is the pre-Einstein view, and unfortunately, it doesn't really allow us to see dark matter. But post-Einstein, gravity affects everything, including light. And so what can actually happen is if I've got dark matter that has a lot of mass that's sitting in between some sun, some stars that I'm looking at, and my telescope, then that clump of mass can actually bend the light rays from that distant star and sort of focus it into my telescope. And what this can do then is really make it appear like there's two stars, right? So if I just trace those light rays back, the ones that have been bent, and I imagine as per usual that light is just traveling in a straight line, then those two light rays, which are actually coming from the same star, really look like they're coming from two stars. So post-Einstein, as an astronomer, if there's a pile of dark matter in between me and a star, what I might actually observe is, in fact, two seemingly similar stars that are actually one and the same. So if I see two stars or two structures in the night sky that really, really look quite similar and are quite nearby, a light bulb might go off of my head and I might say, ah, aha, 
those two objects are really the same object and what's happening is this phenomenon of gravitational lensing which is allowing for the light from that single star to actually be focused around some matter that I'm not seeing some dark matter and and that's that's how I can actually understand that there is some intervening dark mass between that star and my telescope that I'm not seeing. And this is precisely how that image was made a few slides back with the bullet cluster merger of where the dark matter was. Astronomers were able to actually indirectly infer those clumps, those blue clumps of dark matter by looking at the light from those background stars which was being distorted gravitationally. So as another interesting historical aside for a second, this phenomenon of gravitational lensing was one of the first really big key predictions of general relativity which established it on a firm sort of experimental uh, uh, understanding and, and uh, proof and this came from the 1919 total solar eclipse. This was some astronomical observations done by Cromlin, Dyson, and Eddington. And actually, this, this image that I'm showing here is, in fact, uh, after a little bit of image restoration, modern image restoration, this is, in fact, one of their photographic plates that they took of that total solar eclipse. So the interesting thing to point out here is that they took this photographic plate and they noticed the Taurus stars that you see here uh, quite close to the sun. Now, not literally close to the sun, but the light from those Taurus suns coming close to the sun. And since the light from these Taurus stars was coming close to the sun, and since it was an eclipse, so you could actually see those Taurus stars, they weren't totally... Uh, uh, obscured by the brightness of the sun, these astronomers were able to notice that the light from these Taurus stars, and in particular the Taurus stars that were closer to the sun, or that had their light coming closer to the sun, they were able to notice that the relative positions of these Taurus stars looked distorted that it looked like the light from these Taurus stars was actually being bent by the gravitational presence of the sun. And this was the first evidence for gravitational lensing. And like I said, it really put general relativity on a very firm, experiential, uh, firm, experimental basis. Whereas prior to it, uh, it had really only had uh, theoretical motivations and, and really was still just living in the land of a nice, a nice theory that may or may not be true. So at this point, you might say, okay, well, I, I understand that there's quite a lot of this dark matter stuff, and I understand how we've seen it, and I understand how we've inferred its presence, and I understand that it's very different, but you know, why, why else might I care about this dark matter stuff? And there's one very fundamental kind of historical reason for why you, you personally and all humans and all life for that matter might really care about this dark matter stuff. And that's because dark matter was responsible for seeding all of the structure in our universe that we observe today. So to see that, I've got a nice little uh, simulation video coming from the illustrious collaboration. On the left hand side we're going to see dark matter and on the right hand side we're going to see ordinary matter. It says gas temperature here but you should really think of gas temperature as a placeholder for ordinary matter density. And importantly we're going to start the simulation at roughly a billion years after the Big Bang and I just want you to take note, first of all, before we even start the video, that the dark matter on the left is already starting to clump, while the ordinary matter on the right hasn't quite yet. So let's play this forward and see what happens. So the dark matter on the left 
It's already starting to clump and it continues to clump more and more due to its gravitational interactions with itself. And as this dark matter is falling into these interesting clumpy structures in the large universe, we're finding on the right hand side that all of the ordinary matter, the ordinary gas that was in the early universe, is also falling into those same clumpy structures. So in this way, dark matter was all of our cosmic parent and really was the cosmic parent of everything that we observe in the universe. So you might be saying to yourself, well, hey, this, this sort of like spider webby structure, that doesn't really look like uh, the present universe to me. And you'd be correct. And that's simply because this animation is given at the largest distance scales. So in this follow-up animation, we're going to actually zoom in to the previous simulation starting at the 40 megaparsec scales, which is insanely large, and we're going to slowly zoom in and zoom in, and eventually, hopefully, we might find some structures that are more familiar to us. So we're zooming through, we're seeing gas metallicity now, and eventually we're now looking at the stellar light, and now you can see as we zoom in further and further, we're starting to see ordinary galaxy looking structures. So indeed, the previous video that I showed you, that previous simulation, is actually simulating what our universe looks like at the largest structure scales all the way down to the galaxy scales. And therefore, the dark matter really is this important cedar of all of the vast structure and the minute galaxy structure in the universe that we see. So now, Another natural question to have is, what, what is this stuff? We, we know that this dark matter stuff exists. We know how much of it there is. We know we can't really see it. And we know it was important and has been important in the history of our universe. But, but what ideas are out there for what this thing could be? So one very popular class of ideas for what dark matter could be are called weakly interacting massive particles or WIMPs. So let me just take a second to break down all the different components of this name. So the weakly interacting part, hopefully you have some idea of what that could mean a little bit just based off of the bullet cluster video that I showed you. Recall that we realized dark matter was kind of ghost-like and just passed one through the other, dark matter goes through the ordinary matter. So in this sense, the dark matter we know must be weakly interacting. And then the massive particle part of the name, well, we know that it has to have mass. We know that the dark matter is sitting in galaxies, for instance, and it's tugging on those outermost stars. So we know that if dark matter is made up of a single fundamental particle or a few different fundamental particles, we know that they, they have mass because they, they need to be uh, gravitationally pulling in those outermost stars. So this is what we mean by WIMP. So let me be a little bit more quantitative now at just how weakly interacting we know dark matter has to be. So again, let me just show you an illustration of our Milky Way. And let me imagine putting a WIMP uh, really far out in our Milky Way as far out as our Earth and solar system is from the center of our Milky Way, a few tens of thousands of light years. And now let's imagine shooting this WIMP particle through something that's substantially dense. So I chose lead as a, as a pedagogical example. So let's, let's take this WIMP and let's try to shoot it through a block of lead. And now a question we can ask is, how many times would that WIMP accidentally bump into some of the atoms in that huge block of lead? Now keep in mind that this block of lead is, like I said, tens of thousands of light years long. So even if this WIMP was going at the speed of light, which it's not, uh, 
on average, usually dark matter is not going that fast or nearly that fast in galaxies. But even if this dark matter was going at the speed of light, it would take tens of thousands of years for it to go through this massive block of lead. And how many times would this thing scatter? Well, it would scatter something like 35 or fewer times. So that's, that's incredibly weakly interacting. And this, this is a number that I encourage you to keep in your head just to really hone in on how odd and different and ghost-like and weakly interacting this dark matter stuff is. And now for something completely different. How did the weakly interacting massive particle best Mad Max in a fight? It was matter. Ha ha. Okay. But um bump. JK, it couldn't touch him. All right. So I really like this online format of giving a public talk because I can say my dad jokes and not be substantially judged by a live audience. And I think it's also great for you, the audience viewing, because if you're sitting at your home or place of work and you're giggling a little bit to yourself, hopefully, uh, you don't have to be judged for finding this horrible, horrible humor amusing. But I digress. So let's return to the story of dark matter. So if dark matter is a wimp, uh, how might we find it? So let's say that uh, you're an experimental physicist an experimental particle physicist, let's say, and you're sitting and you're trying to look for this wimp that's coming in to the Earth. Now, we know that this dark matter stuff, if, if it's a wimp or something, it, it really should be passing through the Earth quite a lot because our galaxy has dark matter, as I already mentioned uh, a while ago, just like all other galaxies that we can observe. And so we know that this dark matter stuff is, is passing through Earth regularly. So if you're an experimental particle physicist and you're looking for this dark matter, what might you do? You might just build a huge hunk of stuff that you hope the dark matter would come in and accidentally bump into. Now, you really do need a huge hunk of stuff, and this is perhaps obvious since I just told you that a wimp passing through tens of thousands of light years of lead would only scatter 35 or fewer times. It would only bump into lead 35 or fewer times. So if I have a wimp that's coming through my detector, my, my hunk of material on Earth, it's really like never ever going to hit it. So you might already say, well, hey, we're kind of... Uh, dead in the water here. There's there's no possible way that this dark matter is going to interact with uh, some something that I have in my lab. And that's true. An individual wimp has an astonishingly small probability that it's going to knock into anything in your hunk of material. Where we went here over our thought experiment of a single wimp going through a block of lead is that there's actually quite a lot of dark matter that would be passing through this experiment. Not just a single wimp, but lots and lots of wimps uh, per second would be going through a large enough experiment. And so in this way, if you build a large enough experiment that has low enough backgrounds and you wait a long enough time, you might eventually see a single one of those many wimps that have gone through your experiment accidentally bump into some of the stuff in your detector. So this is the hope. This is the hope. But now there's, there's a tricky bit, and it's, uh, it's kind of obvious, and that is that ordinary stuff really interacts with ordinary matter, my ordinary detector material, substantially more than dark matter, right? And again, just going back to the bullet cluster, we saw that normal matter really interacts with and bumps into normal matter way more than the ghostly dark matter. So if I'm setting up a detector and I'm just looking for a very, very rare bump that might be coming from dark matter, somehow I have to make sure that no ordinary matter is bumping into the stuff in my detector. 
So one thing you could be worried about as an experimental particle physicist, for instance, is the fact that on the surface of the Earth, there happens to be one muon coming in uh, per roughly the area of your hand per second. And that's actually a, a very large rate because those muons are going to go into your detector and they're really going to knock into stuff and you're going to see them. So how, how are you going to reduce this, this background? Well, you stick your detector way deep underground. You build it way deep underground or under a mountain, and then you can reduce the background of ordinary matter coming in, let's say from these muons, substantially. So in the muon example, now there's not one per area of your hand per second, but that per second gets reduced down to now one per area of your hand per month, which is a substantial reduction. So this sort of setup is, is actually how dark matter direct detection experiments work. So for instance, one of these dark matter direct detection experiments is called the Lex Zeppelin, sorry, Lux Zeppelin experiment. So this is a tweet that Berkeley Labs sent out regarding this experiment. They have question, how do you get a 5,000 pound, nine foot tall particle detector designed to hunt for dark matter nearly a mile underground? And their answer, though not terribly enlightening, is very carefully, and I'm sure they had to do it very carefully. So you see here uh, a beautiful picture of their massive detector that they mentioned. And indeed, they buried it incredibly deep underground. So they put it in particular in the Sanford Underground Research Facility, which is an old gold mine in South Dakota that is no longer a functioning gold mine and has since been converted into a substantial underground research facility where this LZ experiment is located along with many others. I should also mention at this point that the L and the Z and LZ stand for Lux Zeppelin and Lux and Zeppelin themselves are their own acronyms. So this might be a case of acronym overkill, but we sort of have to forgive this experimental collaboration because it actually is a merger of two previous experiments, namely the Lux experiment and the Zeppelin experiment, and hence the double acronym in their name. But returning back to how this experiment and similar dark matter direct detection experiments function. So here's a beautiful image shown uh, by LZ of exactly how their detector works. So the incoming dark matter particle comes in and hopefully, if you're really, really lucky, once in a blue moon, a dark matter particle is going to knock into some of the xenon atoms that they have in their detector. And when it knocks into those xenon atoms, they emit some light. And if you're lucky, they might also sometimes emit light that then causes electrons to shoot off from some xenon atoms. And then those electrons also emit light. And then what the LZ experiment actually looks for at the end of the day is they look for all of this light. The light coming from the initial xenon atoms being kicked and the light coming from those subsequent electrons also shining off some light. And now at the top and the bottom of the experiment, you see all these like little circular kind of panels and those are actually photomultiplier tubes or PMTs. So these are ultra, ultra sensitive uh, detectors that can see single photons of light. And hopefully if you've reduced all of your backgrounds and if they've put it deep enough underground and, and they control for radioactivity and they have ultra pure xenon, hopefully they're not really seeing any light at all or, or very frequently. And so when a dark matter comes in and causes all this light to come out, Hopefully they can see that signal and then infer that, oh, this is, this is actually coming from uh, dark matter that's interacting with our xenon. So as you might suspect, LZ is not the only game in town. There's another massive xenon-based dark matter direct detection experiment called, fittingly, the xenon experiment. And here we see it. It's about three stories tall currently. 
This is the xenon one ton experiment, but there's actually been several iterations of this xenon collaboration. It started off with xenon 10, with 10 kilograms of the xenon. Then it went to xenon 100. Now it's at xenon one ton. It's going to next be at xenon n ton, so getting larger and larger. And that larger and larger volume is again, just to have a better shot at having dark matter come in and hit something in your detector. So these kinds of dark matter direct detection experiments have been scaling up progressively over the past uh, decade, decade and a half. And this one you see is even three, story three stories tall currently. So not only is this experiment and experiments like it physically large, they're also really large sort of collaborations. So the Xenon experiment, for instance, is made up of 27 member institutions and has over 160 scientists, some of these institutions shown here. And I, I just wanted to point this out because I find it as a theoretical physicist, I'm kind of looking from the outside in when, I, when I'm looking at these dark matter experiments. And I find it very encouraging that so many people from so many different places come together to work on a common, intriguing, mysterious goal of discovering this, this stuff that we have no idea. And I, I, I'm encouraged by this, and I'm also encouraged by the fact that there are more than a dozen dark matter experiments ongoing now, and several dozen that have already been conducted in the past. And my fingers are crossed, but I, I'm very hopeful that we'll actually find dark matter in, in one of these amazingly sensitive experiments any day now. So if you're a little bit less patient like myself though, and you don't want to just wait for dark matter to be discovered in one of these experiments, you might say, well, what's another way that, that we might discover this dark matter? What's another way that we might see it? So for that, we also need to refer back to a fundamental principle that also came from Einstein this time from his theory of special relativity. And that's simply that E equals MC squared, probably an equation you're familiar with, or at least that you've heard of, arguably one of the most famous equations of all time. And for good reason, all this is telling us and all Einstein taught us is that energy and mass are proportional. The energy in something that's just sitting here is just its mass times the speed of light squared. So, one interesting daily use of this equation we can find in our very own sun and in all stars that are burning. The sun is regularly, regularly using E equals mc squared to churn its mass into energy that we experience as light, fortunately for us. So specifically in the process of nuclear fusion, when lighter nuclei fuse to heavier nuclei, the mass of those heavier nuclei are actually slightly less than the masses of the individual constituents that went into that fusion process. And that deduction in mass is actually converted, the E equals mc squared, into pure light energy that we all benefit from on Earth. So as a fun fact, the sun happens to be burning up millions of tons per second of its mass. So as a particle physicist and a experimental particle physicist, what we try to do is use this e equals mc squared, but we use it in the reverse direction. So instead of converting mass into energy, we're gonna to try to convert energy into mass. And in particular, in this case, we're gonna to try to convert pure energy into dark matter. So to understand how we might do this, let's imagine that we've got a single proton. And for this illustration, I wanted to use a Lego brick because like a proton, a single Lego brick is a fundamental building block. So let's have two protons and let's imagine that we're going to collide these two protons at incredibly high energies. Namely, we're gonna accelerate both of these protons to really, really, really close the speed of light and then we're gonna bang them, crash right one into the other. Now, why might we do this? 
Well, it's because E equals MC squared. And if I dump a ton of energy into a single point in space time, out can pop some really massive stuff. So what might pop out of this sort of collision? Well, we might have uh, some, again, very massive stuff, which in my Lego analogy is going to be stuff with lots and lots of Lego bricks. So on the left-hand side here, I've got this full, beautiful, intricate, uh, Stranger Things Lego set that pops out. And on the right-hand side, I have uh, a slightly less massive pile of still interesting and different colored bricks representing different fundamental particles than those initial protons that went into the collision. So on the left-hand side, I'm going to let my Stranger Things set be my dark matter. And this is appropriate for more than one reason. If you're a fan of the show, you might know about the upside down and the upside down in the show is, is really kind of similar to dark matter in that it's supposed to be everywhere and pervasive and at the same time invisible to the naked eye. But I digress. So let's let this Stranger Things Lego set be the dark matter. And then we can say, okay, well, well, maybe we could make this. Maybe if I smash two protons hard enough, one against the other, I could pop out this dark matter stuff. But the problem is, how could we actually see that we've made dark matter, right? Dark matter is still dark. So I can't naively see that I've, that I've made it. And then the trick is really just to look at the other stuff that you've made right? So even though I can't see the dark matter necessarily that I've made from this incredibly high energy collision of protons, I can see all of the ordinary matter that might also come out from that collision. And then if I see a bunch of ordinary matter moving this way, and I don't see anything else moving this way, I can use momentum conservation to infer, oh, there's actually got to be some invisible massive stuff that shot off that way, and maybe that's that's the dark matter. So this is precisely another way that experimental particle physicists are looking for dark matter. So in particular, they're looking for dark matter in this way at the Large Hadron Collider. So this is a picture of the LHC in Geneva, Switzerland. And this ring is a ring in which uh, scientists at CERN are pumping protons at nearly the speed of light and then colliding them into each other and making all sorts of more massive, interesting particles. Uh, interestingly, this ring is 27 kilometers in circumference, so quite large. You can actually see at the bottom left here, the Geneva airport, which is substantially smaller. And in the dotted line here, you can also see the border between Switzerland and France. So I'm not entirely sure. I have to assume that the protons that are going around this ring have dual citizenship, but I don't know if that's ever been written down. So you might have heard of CERN and the LHC for other reasons. For instance, CERN was actually the first place where the internet was invented in 1989. And it was also where the Higgs boson was discovered in 2012 a very fundamental particle that's important in our understanding of the universe because it's responsible for giving every particle that has mass its mass. So a very important particle to have discovered. And here we see two of the detectors that are that are buried deep inside that tunnel underground. One is Atlas and one is CMS. And these two detectors are looking for all sorts of new particles that could be coming out of these proton-proton collisions. And in particular, they're, they're also looking for dark matter. So I'm hopeful that maybe one of the next major discoveries uh, to come out of the LHC will be dark matter in the next 10 years or so. But finally, to kind of end my talk, I, I should return back to a little bit of astronomy. I, I really appreciate being invited to give this Mount Tam astronomy talk, and especially as a theoretical physicist. So I wanted to end on a note of how we might find dark matter via astronomy. Of course, 
we learned that really the first ways that we knew anything about dark matter at all was coming from astronomy. And if once we discover dark matter, that also might be coming from astronomy as well. So here's an artist's illustration of a terrific telescope and satellite, the Fermi Lat Telescope. And here's a beautiful image that this telescope took over five years of observation where uh, the middle plane here is our very own Milky Way plane. Okay, so this telescope observed our very own Milky Way and in particular, it observed it in uh, gamma ray frequencies. So very, very high energy uh, light. And you probably can't pick this out by eye. And certainly you can't, and neither can I, because you have to do quite a lot of data analysis and, and background subtraction from this, pic from this picture to, to see what I'm about to show you. But it turns out that right in the center of this image, right in the center of our Milky Way, there is a roughly circular excess of gamma rays. Now this is very, very exciting and has excited a lot of astronomers and astrophysicists and physicists for several years now. It's very exciting because this uh, roughly circular looking axis excess in these gamma rays might be coming from dark matter. So in particular, of course, we know that dark matter is dark, so it, it can't be giving off light by itself. But what could be happening is right at the center of our galaxy, two dark matter particles could be getting together. And much like the protons we're using at the LHC, smashing into each other and making stuff, these two dark matter particles might come together, smash into one another, and out pop out a couple really, really high energy photons, really high energy light. And so this might actually be our first image of dark matter. It's still a lot of analysis. There's still a lot of analysis and work that needs to be done to, to uh, conclude this conclusively. The center of the Milky Way is a very difficult thing to understand. There are lots of sources of gamma rays there. So this is by no means the end of the story yet, but perhaps a few decades from now, maybe sooner, we might appreciate in hindsight that what we're looking at right now is one of our first true images of dark matter. So let me end with this uh, nice high note of, of how astronomy might illuminate what dark matter is. So over the course of this talk, I've told you a little bit about how much dark matter there is and how we first discovered dark matter, what, what first clues we had that there was this invisible massive stuff I told you a little bit about one of the particles it might be, uh, what, what it could be. Maybe it's this weakly interacting massive particle. And I spent the last little bit of the talk talking about three different ways that physicists and astronomers are trying to really pin down and discover what this mysterious substance is, namely through maybe having it come in and knock into something in your massive direct detection experiment or through actually producing dark matter at the Large Hadron Collider, or through observing its annihilation, its dark matter collisions with itself into high energy gamma rays at the center of our own Milky Way. Regardless of how we discover dark matter though, I hope you leave this talk with one final headline which is that dark matter, while still elusive, is illuminated. I hope you enjoyed watching Illuminating Dark Matter with theoretical physicist and soon-to-be doctor Robert McGeehy. These programs are produced by Mount Tam Astronomy in collaboration with the Friends of Mount Tam, with the San Francisco Amateur Astronomers, 
and with Wonderfest, the Bay Area beacon of science. The programs are free and open to all. Mount Tam Astronomy is organized by Tinka Ross, and this video was produced by John Navas. To attend a live program, followed by live telescope viewing of the night sky, or for a list of upcoming Astronomy Nights programs, visit our website at friendsofmounttam.org. From Mount Tam Astronomy, I'm Tucker Hyatt.